back to yet another end of the year of 2016 top 10. I uh, figured everybody else is doing them. Why not join in on the fun, right? Well, this one is going to be my top 10 other great games of 2016. Now, I've already told you that my number 11 spot is ice cool for the year. So uh, understand that it's not on this list because that's kind of, I don't know, uh, telegraphed information, right? You, 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 I don't want to give away one of my spots uh, for this list uh, because of something that I said in another list. So uh, my number 11 actually is Ice Cool, but this list is going to be, I guess you could say, my 12 to 21 <laughs> or something to that effect. These are 10 other games that I haven't yet already mentioned on another top 10 of 2016 kind of list. Um, we have uh, already recorded a list of surprises of 2016, so none of those games that you haven't seen yet are on this list. So um, there you have it. I just wanted to make sure that these were 10 other games that I have not yet talked about in one of these end of the year 2016 review-ish top 10 videos. That was very succinct, wasn't it? So anyway, with all of those caveats in place, let's go ahead and get to uh, my top 12 to 21 games, but they're going to be labeled 10 to 1, just to further confuse you. Let's hit it. So my number 10 of 10 other great games of 2016 is none other than Terraforming Mars. If any one company had a tremendous year this year, I think it's probably Stronghold Games, and I'm not just saying that because I like the owner. They have had a number of games come out this year that have all been really good games. And a lot of people have liked them. Great Western Trail, um, Terraforming Mars, uh, Sola Fide, a lot of people have liked that one. I'm probably missing some as well. They've just had a really good year. And Terraforming Mars is one of those games that I haven't played often, but I can see the value that's there, which is why it's only at my number 10 spot on this list. Um, I've, I want to play it more, and that says something about it, because I, usually if I play a game and I'm not really into it, I, I really don't care if I get it back to the table or not. This one, however, it's, it's lengthy, it is deep, it's convoluted, but it's still really fun, and you can see your colony, so to speak, uh, growing as you go throughout the game. So I really enjoy this game. I want to play it more. I just haven't been able to. My number 10 of 10 other games from 2016. That's the last time I'm going to say that, by the way. Terraforming Mars from Stronghold Games. Now, my number 9 is a game that was kind of a, kind of a re-theme because uh, there was another game that we used to play all the time that was basically the same, but it had a, uh, a fantasy theme on it. Uh, Defenders of the Last Realm. Now, Defenders of the Last Stand is cleaned up, I guess you could say. It feels more thematic. It's a post-apocalyptic version of basically the same game where you have these different factions that are rushing toward uh, the Last Stand, a city called the Last Stand. And all of the players are heroes that are trying to work together to defeat all of these different uh, factions that are rushing to try to take over the last bastion of of civility left in the world. And uh, I really enjoyed the theme. Comes with a ton of miniatures. Now the miniatures aren't that great, but there's a ton of them in there and they're not bad. <clears throat> so with all that being said, I really enjoyed the, the gameplay of it. I loved the, the setting that the game took place in. Everything just kind of coalesced into this game that I wasn't really expecting to enjoy. Um, I mean, I was intrigued by all of the plastic goodness that was inside of it. And uh, I, I usually am one to like Richard Launius' games. So I was intrigued by it, but I wasn't like chomping at the bit to try to go play it. And when we finally did get it to the table, I really, really enjoyed this game a lot. So if you haven't had a chance to try it yet, I, I strongly encourage you to do that. Defenders of the Last Stand, my number nine. Now, my number eight is another retheme. Now, I, I, I know we gave Z a whole lot of trouble about this in uh, his best of 2016, and most of that was tongue-in-cheek. Most of it, not all of it. But uh, the idea of this game, 
Um, I loved Hera and Zeus. I didn't love it. Uh, I misspoke there. I, I liked Hera and Zeus, but I wasn't really taken with the theme. I'm not big on Greek mythology or uh, whatever that might be. Uh, yeah, that's Greek mythology. Anyway, uh, but I'm really taken with Norse myth North mythology. I really enjoy that. So when Thunder and Lightning came out, I really enjoyed this idea. Plus, the artwork in this one wasn't too keen on the artwork in Hera and Zeus, but the artwork in, in, in Thunder and Lightning is off the chain cool. I really enjoyed it a lot. I love the strategic um, placement of cards, trying to hide that one card that if, the, if your opponent finds it, uh, he wins. And uh, all the different card play that's in there, I love the game a lot. I love that it's a two-player game. That means I don't have to be at a game night or anything like that to be able to play it. I can play it with my family, with my wife, uh, with somebody that's over to the house, whatever. Uh, I don't have to be in a special kind of situation to play this game, and that's one of the reasons why it really hit high uh, on my ear. That's Thunder and Lightning. Now, my number seven of this year is... <laughs> Another retheme, uh, but this one is a thematic retheme, and I really enjoy those things. Uh, Pandemic Iberia. Now, this was Z's number uh, one, I believe, of the year, and that's, I guess, rightfully so. He, he loves Pandemic, so Pandemic Iberia. There's a lot of good things about this. Everything that Z said about it, how the historical theme really takes hold uh, in this one, how Everything that you're doing in the game just makes a little bit more sense with the theme that it has. Uh, everything that's in this game is really, really cool. And I actually probably like this version of Pandemic better than regular Pandemic. Now, not better than Pandemic Legacy. Unfortunately, Pandemic Legacy is one of those games that you, you, you play it once, uh, all through all, you know, all 12 months and all that, and you're, you're pretty much done with it, especially if you have any kind of a good memory. But with Pandemic Iberia, it has that same thematic feel that Pandemic Legacy has, although it's a different theme, uh, but it still has that, but it also has the longevity that uh, I was I was wanting to have from a, a Pandemic game or something to that effect. So I really uh, had a great time playing this. Uh, I played it with Z, uh, first off, when we, we got it up at Essen, and it was just enjoyable. I was surprised. I wasn't expecting too much out of it because I'm not too hot on Pandemic anyway, um, but I really did enjoy it. And if you haven't tried it, you should. You should. Uh, that's Pandemic Iberia, my number seven. My number six is a game that I already mentioned in passing back uh, when I was talking about Terraforming Mars, and it's another game by Stronghold called Sola Fide, The Reformation. And this is a game that uh, pits two people against each other. One is taking the role of the Protestants, and the other one is taking the role of the Catholics uh, back in during the age of the Reformation. And uh, it is that struggle between those two factions, so to speak, of uh, trying to garner the control of not only the, the commoners, but also the nobility. And you're doing that from different region to different region. And, and uh, whoever scores the most points is basically the winner. But it's the card play that really made this one cool for me. Uh, I also liked, enjoyed the theme as well. So there's a lot that was pulling me towards this, and I really enjoyed it. I was kind of uh, anxious about it to begin with because when a secular uh, entity tries to handle religious materials, sometimes they just don't get it all right. But luckily, uh, not luckily, I, I, I can't say that, but with that being said, they handled the property very well, the historical property, that is. And so I'm very uh, pleased with Soda Fide, the Reformation, and that's why it made my number six. Now, my number five is a game from Games Workshop. It's called Warhammer Quest The Silver Tower. Now, this is another reprint that uh, Games Workshop came out with, new models, uh, new scenarios, that type of stuff. I didn't play the original, so <clears throat> uh, this one was kind of new for me. It wasn't, didn't seem like a reprint. It was just new for me. Uh, so I really enjoyed everything about the game as far as the uh, different heroes that are just not normally part of the same faction. They're coming together to try to defeat this evil wizard uh, that, that is holed up in this silver tower and all the minions that he's sending at us. Uh, over over the course of the game is is just really fun and interesting to me. I, I, I'm a sucker for, first of all, games that have great miniatures, and Games Workshop definitely delivers on that. 
end. Um, I'm also a sucker for variable player powers, which is where each hero has his own special ability and that type of thing. So I, I enjoyed a lot of the stuff that is in this game. Um, the, the, the components other than the miniatures could stand to be upgraded. They seem kind of archaic, but the artwork on them is very good. They are um, thematic enough to, to, to keep you where you need to be as far as uh, that's concerned to enjoy the game thematically. So uh, it's not a big hit, but I think it's something that they should probably look at for future games is just a little bit of an upgrade for their components, but the game itself is great. I, I enjoy it a lot. That's my number five, Warhammer Quest The Silver Tower. Now, my number four is a game that I was able to play not only once, but twice during the cruise uh, that we had just a couple uh, weeks ago, the Dice Tower Cruise, and it's a new game from Cool Mini or Not Limited. It's called Raise Your Goblets. Now, in Raise Your Goblets, you are representing your family at a banquet that's been called by some person of nobility on the other side of the continent or whatever. Um, and you, you're sent to represent your family, but you're also sent to target another representative from another family uh, and try to poison them. Now, there are goblets set up on the table, and they're seeded with wine tokens and antidote tokens and poison tokens, and you have one in front of you that's always considered yours, um, <clears throat> and during the course of your turn, you can either uh, pour uh, some of the wine antidote or uh, poison tokens that you have begun the game with into one of the cups. You can peek at one of the cups. You can swap two of the cups from their places. You can rotate them. You can do any number. You can do a certain number of things, but you can do those two actions. You can do those actions twice, whatever you choose to do. The gist of the game is that you're trying to survive the round while at the same time poison your target. And if you do both of those, uh, you can score uh, close to the maximum number of points. But if you also have the most wine in your goblet, you can also score an additional point. So the most points that you can score in a round is four. Um, but usually you're, you're probably going to score anywhere from uh, zero to three most of the time. Uh, and it's just uh, at the end of three rounds, whoever has the most points is the winner. It's a really fun social deduction feeling kind of game, but it has a really strong memory element, but it's not that bad. I usually don't like memory element games. It's not that bad, though, because you really only have to keep track of two goblets, a bad goblet and, 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 a, and a safe goblet, so that you can try to make sure that the safe goblet is in front of you and the bad goblet is in front of your target. Now... Uh, I really enjoy the game. You need to try this game if you like any of the things that I just said. Social deduction, memory, uh, hidden player powers, all this, uh, not hidden, but uh, variable player powers, uh, a number of different things. It has variants. It goes all the way up to 12 players, a 7 to 12 player variant. It also has a 2 to 3 player variant. I say that uh, you kind of can do away with the 2 to 3 player variant. And this is really a 4 to 6 player game that has rules for 7 to 12. So uh, that is that. My number 4 raise your goblets. My number three for the year is a game called London Dread, put out by Gray Fox Games. And it is a cooperative um, programming game where the players are trying to find uh, the key to the mystery of a bunch of things that are going on in the city of London. So it's a sleuthy kind of who done it kind of game, but you're all working together, but you're having to program your movement throughout the course of the city, uh, and that takes the bulk and of the game. After that timer has run out, which is another thing, it's timed programming, which is, I'm, I'm usually like, whoa, stay away. Um, uh, after that timed programming is over, then you uh, go through the course of everything that you plan to do, and, and hopefully you've won, hopefully you haven't. So why do I like this game? Well, first of all, it's cooperative time programming. So while someone has the opportunity and, and maybe they program their stuff quicker than somebody else, now instead of just sitting there and being quiet, they can actually go help people and say, no, I think you need to go here. No, I need help over here and go do this. And so it has that cooperative uh, sense. So the programming and the timed programming part of it, I'm, I'm giving a pass on because of that cooperative nature. Usually when I don't like programming, especially timed programming, is when uh, there is uh, competitive factors in the game. And so people are trying to stop you from doing what you're trying to do. But in this game, they're not. They need you to do what they want, what you need to do so that, so that they can win as well. 
So I really enjoyed this game a lot. It has a great little cool app that provides a real thematic mood while you're playing the game, music and reading of cards and that type of thing. Really great, great job uh, to do all of that. I really enjoyed the game. My number three, London Dread. My number two is a game called V Commandos. It's put out by Triton Noir. It's a new company, new uh, designer, brand new game for 2016. It kickstarted here just uh, uh, about a month ago, and uh, fulfillment has already been uh, out. It should be reaching stores, I believe, around January or February. Uh, but this is a great World War II game. Now, I'm a sucker for World War II games anyway, but this one has a little bit of a difference because instead of a regular... World War II game, you're not just trying to go in guns blazing and, and achieve this objective and kill the enemy and all this other kind of stuff. No, it is a, um, a, a, a stealthy World War II game where you are a, a member of a commando team that is being sent behind enemy lines to accomplish an objective and get back home with intelligence or uh, you know a, a prisoner that has that you're rescuing or something to that effect. You know it, it has a number of different scenarios that come in the game, but um, so the whole point of the game really is to stay hidden as much as humanly possible uh, without being found out. Because if you get found out, the alarm starts going off. Oh my goodness, the proverbial feces is hitting the fan, if you know what I mean, because you are incredibly outnumbered as far as enemies to heroes ratio, and uh, your likelihood of, of winning uh, after that alarm has been tripped drastically drops. And so you want to stay hidden as much as possible, and that's what I really liked about it. They didn't take the normal, um, let's you know, going guns playing Rambo style uh, World War II game. This is a, a, a very, uh, a more thought provoking, a more um, planning, strategic kind of game than uh, anything else. So I really enjoyed V Commandos. I, I can't wait for you guys to be able to get a hold of it and give it a whirl. It is really a game that I've enjoyed very much this year. V Commandos from Twi Triton Noir. And my number one is a game from Monolith, and it is called Conan. Now, this one probably would have made my top 10 of 2016 had I played it earlier than I did. I played it only a couple of weeks ago, just before the the um, the cruise happened, uh, about a week maybe before the cruise. And so I, I just really didn't have enough playtime with it. Now, uh, first time we played it, we played it twice in a row. So that tells you something. It is a very simple game. I love the uh, the tokens, the action tokens that are used in it because not only are they your action tokens, they're also your health. So when you start losing health, you start losing action tokens, and you have to be very uh, economical with how you spend these actions so that you can make sure you don't die on the uh, Overlord's turn. That brings me to the other really cool thing about the game. The Overlord's uh, way of, of pulling actions is really, really neat. Each unit has its own little placard in a row of placards, and they're set up a certain way. And on top of that row, each slot has a number of tokens that you have to spend in order to activate that unit. And when you activate that unit, he goes to the back of the line. And so... Uh, it gets if you want to activate that unit again, you can, but it's going to really cost you a lot of tokens to do that. And I really enjoyed that about it. Um, I thought it was a very uh, interesting mechanic for the Overlord that gives them freedom to do whatever they want to do, but they also have to be very economical in how they choose uh, to activate their units. Really enjoyed the game. Unfortunately, it does have some artwork that I can't really go on board with. Um, <clears throat> Uh, fortunately, though, that artwork is really only one character that I've mentioned in the game. The rule book, you're probably going to have to do something with. Maybe it's just an American thing, but I'm definitely not pulling it out and plastering it on my wall. I'll put it that way. So anyway, uh, I really enjoy the gameplay of Conan. Uh, artwork aside, I really enjoyed everything else about the game. I thought it was very thematic. Each of the different players have a very different style. Uh, or characters, rather, in the game have a very different style. The scenarios are all uh, very um, engrossing. So uh, I really enjoyed the game. I, I just wish I had played it earlier in the year. That's my number one of the top ten other games of 2016. Oop, I said it again, didn't I? Oh, well. My number one is Conan. 
So I guess that actually makes it my number 12. Anyway, thank you for joining me. I hope uh, that uh, you guys have enjoyed this video. Put it in the comments whether you thought that my choices were good or bad or indifferent or whatever. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll defend myself to the last. Anyway, we'll see you guys on the flip side. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.